Hello the internet and welcome back to my channel. Today on the bench we have two Apple IIcs from 1984. Well actually we only have one, this is the one we're going to work on today. Uh, this is my own Apple IIc, you've seen this before on this channel, on uh, one or two videos, and it's only here to say hi, and in case I need to do a comparison with a working machine. There are actually a few differences between these two machines besides the color, that this one is much more yellow than this one. And the main one is that this is a PAL machine and this is an NTSC machine. Now, first thing first, you can see that where it says keyboard, disk use and power on the NTSC machine, it only has icons on the PAL machine. This is considered to be the international version. So maybe whoever is using it doesn't speak English and they replace the English names with icons. The other massive difference between these two machines, which is not really uh, because it's a PAL and NTSC machine, it just happens to be like that, is that this machine, I believe, has an Alps keyboard. And I understand they are pretty rare, and I can tell you, it's absolutely amazing. The other difference is that the NTSC machine obviously is assembled in the USA. It says 120 volts AC power supply. I'm going to use a, a different power supply today. So what matters is that this machine can be powered with 15 volts DC. The PAL machine obviously says it's assembled in Ireland, 220 volts power supply, but again, 15 volts DC as the main input for both machines. So I can use the same power supply for both. But the main difference between these two machines is that the PAL machine, it's only black and white, while the NTSC machine, if connected to an NTSC monitor or capture device, it's actually a colored machine. Now, I'm not entirely sure why that is, because the Apple IIc was released after the Apple IIe, and the PAL version of the Apple IIe was actually able of uh, displaying color on screen. If you know more, do leave a comment down below. I do suspect that this is an NTSC machine internally with an NTSC color burst, uh, but it's outputting 50 Hertz. So it's seen as PAL, but obviously the PAL decoder doesn't see the uh, PAL color burst. So it doesn't see the colors. Uh, I suspect that that's what happens as it will used to happen with the Apple II Europlus, which was an NTSC machine uh, with 50 Hertz output. But anyways, I haven't really tested this machine, so I don't know what works and what doesn't. So first thing first, let me thank today's sponsor, PCBWay, more of that in a minute. Let me put away my Apple IIc, it might come back at some point if I need it, and let's try and power up this machine and see if it works. All right, to power the Apple II, I'm gonna use these Delta Electronics power supply. It's uh, 19 volts output, and uh, from the service manual of the Apple IIc, uh, that's totally fine, even though at the back says 15 volts. Uh, you can go, definitely go up to 15, 19 volts, so that is gonna be totally fine. Now, I know that my capture device usually don't like Apple signals. Uh, we'll see what happens through the composite. Later on, I will try and wire my RGB to HDMI, because uh, there's a very convenient digital video output at the back here, so it would make sense to try and continue with the RGB to HDMI, so at least you can see something that is not jumping all over the place on the screen. Now, because this machine is running on DC, uh, there's, there's no reefers involved or anything that could explode, touch wood. So I feel comfortable in just, you know, plugging my power supply and see what happens. So let's power on the power supply here now. Okay, and let's power up the Apple II in three, two, one, go. Yeah, that's good. Oh, and the picture is actually pretty stable. So it is working. I would say, let me grab a floppy disk and see if it actually runs something. Let's go with Frogger, I guess it's, it's, a, it's a must. Okay, the drive, the drive doesn't sound great. Let me show you. It feels as if the media is not spinning flat. So let me try and just uh, reset the floppy here. No. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, it definitely needs some attention. <laughs> it might just need the matter of cleaning the heads. Uh, this thing is pretty dirty or something. I'm not entirely sure. I see something in these uh, ventilation holes, but I'm not entirely sure. But the um, dry doesn't seem to be working. I know that these... Um, a floppy is working at least, it works on my Apple IIc, and again, that's also a question, is my Apple IIc calibrated? 
align properly. I don't know. I know it works with my Apple IIc and it works with other things, but uh, yeah, I don't really know. Let me try another one just out of curiosity, but I've tested it just a half an hour ago and I know this works. Let's try Fat City. No, it doesn't work at all. So yeah, I would say it's a good reason to open this machine and have a look inside and, and see what happens. Actually, before we open the machine, I just remembered the Apple IIc comes with an integrated self-test. So let's run that. All right, I wasn't expecting this test to last forever. So I had a look online and it looks like that ROM version 255 doesn't really have a self-test. It has a RAM and soft switch exerciser uh, program, which runs indefinitely until you just power it off. So what we can do is to double check and make sure that we actually have version 255 of the ROM. Yeah, version 255, and if I understand correctly, is the oldest uh, ROM available. So maybe there is a way to upgrade it and that would be great. So we have a self-test. I'm not entirely sure what are the differences between the different ROMs, but that's something that we can test. Right, let's open the machine and take a look inside. Now, why do all the computers that I'm working on have rust inside? <laughs> Can I also get one which is like nice and shine and clean and working perfectly fine? Ah, so this has also been improperly stored, unfortunately, uh, which means, you know, it's never a good thing. But anyways, let's uh, get rid of the floppy drive. I can see there's stuff on top here. Uh, which obviously has um, come through this ventilation um, holes. Let's remove everything and let's take a look at the motherboard. Yep, Alps keyboard. This is absolutely amazing. I'd be tempted to swap it with mine. <laughs> <laughs> Not gonna do that, of course, but uh, this is absolutely amazing. This is a fantastic keyboard. Well, the good news is the motherboard is actually in great shape. There is no rust whatsoever. I don't see corrosion. Um, even the ports at the back are not, I mean, they are a bit oxidated, which is expected after so many years, but there is no rust here. The only rust I see is on the cover of the power supply. Everything else looks totally fine. So hopefully, finger crossed, this computer can actually go back to 100%. Right, I thought I had forgotten how to remove this DC-DC converter from the board. I thought I had forgotten a screw, but then I remember that the can here is resting on a piece of rubber. And for, if I can see that right, the rubber has got like a bit like gooey and it's got sticky. So the can is stuck on the rubber. So let me see if I can unstuck it without breaking anything. <laughs> this DC to DC converter literally has eight capacitors, but I'm missing one which I've just ordered. So while I'm waiting for the delivery, we can continue and test the motherboard. Before I start working on the floppy, which seems to have some problems, I'm gonna use my floppy emu. I wanna run some logic tests, some RAM tests, make sure that the motherboard is working. Then we'll move to the floppy and see what's wrong with it. Now, ROM255 won't allow me to plug the floppy emu on the external port. So I'll have to use the uh, onboard port for the time being. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. 
All right, well, after reflashing the floppy emu to Apple II mode, it was a Macintosh mode, it does seem to be working. So I'll run some uh, memory test. I guess I'll leave it running for a while, uh, make sure it works. Meanwhile, we can check those voltages, make sure that everything is okay, even though I still need to recap the power supply, but you know, just uh, to see what the situation is, and then we'll check again at the end. The basic RAM seems to be okay. Uh, this is only the first 64 kilobytes, so this should be a test for the um, extended RAM as well. Auxiliary memory, that's O. And that's gonna test the remaining 64 kilobytes because this computer is featuring 128 kilobytes. And the remaining RAM seems to be fine as well. So that's a very good starting point. The board seems to be working. Now, let me check the keyboard. Yes, the keyboard works totally fine. That is great because this is absolutely amazing. So it just needs a good clean. Now, as I said, this is the PAL version of the 2C, so it's a black and white machine. Now, I had a look online and I got some help from Apple Fritters Forum, and it turns out that this machine is intentionally black and white, and Apple manufactured the dongle, which would be plugged here at the back of the unit on the digital output, and where basically the PAL color circuitry was located. So on the Apple IIe, it was on the motherboard. On the Apple IIc, it was intentionally not on the motherboard, and Apple would sell this dongle for those who would require it. I guess it makes sense as back in the days, color monitors were not popular. So I guess Apple was saving a little bit of money. And if you really wanted the color, you could actually buy the dongle and have your color uh, composite output. So if I'm not mistaken, if I scope the PAL output of this color bar, I shouldn't be able to see any color burst at all, not even the NTSC one. Let's have a look. Um, no, I'm mistaken, there is a color burst. So what you see on screen here is the representation of that color bar, and I can definitely see the color burst, and I'm assuming if I check the frequency of that color burst, it's gonna be the NTSC one, not the PAL one. Let's check that. And there you go, the color burst frequency measures 3.57 megahertz. The NTSC uh, is supposed to be 3.58. Um, it's just an approximate measurement, so that's definitely the NTSC color burst, but I believe because the um, frame rate is 50 Hertz, this is seen as PAL, but obviously PAL is ignoring that frequency because it's not the PAL color burst. And that's why it looks black and white. Now, if I plug this into an NTSC monitor and my capture device can do that, it still wouldn't work because it's the right color burst, but the wrong frame rate. So that's uh, the same situation of the Apple II Euro Plus where uh, we didn't have color because of that reason. Now, I happen here to have an RGB to HDMI device, which I purchased for my IBM repair some time ago. And I know that this also works with Apple II E and C, with the C in particular, it's pretty easy because you can get the signal from the digital output here. You don't have to get it from ICs on the motherboard. And I put together some wiring here. I'm not sure if it's gonna work, but that would be great. So I'm gonna patch it through my capture device and see if we can make it work. Uh, first of all, we should get a better picture in general, but I'm assuming we should also get color. So let's try that. RGB to HDMI is wired. I've no idea whether this works. Let's test this, turn it on now. All right, well, we got something. Uh, I guess I might need to play with the profiles on the RGB to HDMI, but we do have a picture, amazing. <laughs> Look at that, it works and it looks absolutely amazing. And this is so easy, I just plug it at the at the back of the unit. Uh, does the color also work? It does, look at that. Oh, this device is absolutely amazing. The picture is fantastic, great. Though I'm not sure the colors are right, because where it says brown, I have green. Where I have orange, I have green. Purple is orange, uh, dark green is blue, so colors are not right. Let me try with some actual software. Right, it does work, but I don't remember the frog to be blue, to be honest. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on. Let me tinker with some settings here on the RGB to HDMI. 
All right, so I can change the artifact phase, which is the way the Apple II series is generating color. And if I select 270 degrees, I think that's the right color. At least I'm definitely expecting the frog to be green. <laughs> so that should be it. Oh, wow, this is absolutely amazing. And the software is also working. So, so far, so good, I'd like to say. Everything seems to be working well. I don't have the speaker connected, so obviously there's uh, uh, no sound coming through this thing, but it works. So I would say before we move to the floppy, let me double check the voltages coming out of this thing. I'll have to turn the motherboard around because um, uh, there's really not accessible here. And uh, then we'll move to the floppy drive and see if we can make it work. This is the power supply connector, actually it's the DC to DC converter connector and one row is the ground, it's all ground and that's the one accessible from the other side. But I'm interested in this one and uh, looking at the schematics I've written the um, voltages I'm expecting if I'm not mistaken, so we go ground here, minus 12, then it's a plus 12 in, I'm not sure what it is, another ground, plus 5, plus 12 and another ground. So let's turn this on and check that those voltages are all good. Power on now. Yeah, and my five volts is 4.9 something and it looks totally fine. My plus 12 is also totally fine. It says 12 point something and I don't see ripple. Oh, right, okay. So that's the 19 volts coming from the power supply. Uh, well, it says plus 12 in, but obviously it's not that. Uh, yes, obviously that's the power going into the DC to DC converter. So that's coming from a power supply. I'm not concerned about that. And it looks 19 volts. And this is my minus 12, which is minus 11 point something. And minus is always uh, a bit all over the place, but that's fine. Uh, most importantly, I don't see ripple on everything, even though I should probably run the floppy while uh, looking at this. But so far, you know, just a basic test, everything looks okay. Um, I see a minus five at the front. So let's flip the board and check that one too. That's it, I'm reading minus 4.93 and the signal looks reasonably clean. So that's also fine. All right, well, I think it's time to move our attention onto the floppy drive. Now, before getting too crazy about it, I think I'd like to just uh, clean the heads of this drive, you know, open it up, inspect it, uh, have a look while it's working. Uh, chances are you clean the heads and it comes back to life. And then I'll find out whether I can actually run the floppy emu and this floppy drive at the same time on this board. Otherwise, I'll just get my Apple IIe and that's 100% easier to deal with these situations. It's PCBWay's 10th anniversary. I wasn't aware that PCBWay had been around for so long. Take a look at PCBWay.com. There is a very nice page where you can explore the story, the history of PCBWay. There's also an interactive map of the world where you can find some of the users of PCBWay.com. And I'm there, of course, uh, in the UK. Don't forget to play this game. You might win something. I actually won something, so good luck to you. Now, the Apple IIc, being a compact machine, is a bit less expandable, but all the other Apple II machines are very expandable and there's plenty of projects for those machines which PCBWay can manufacture for you. This PCB, for example, is a ROM replacement I use for my Apple Europlus repair video, and as usual, it's very easy to have these PCBs manufactured. All you need to do, as usual, is to find the Gerber file of the project of your choice, upload it on PCBWay.com, and the process is more or less automatic. You might want to choose the color of the PCB, select a postal service, and the PCBs will be delivered at your place. PCBWay can also populate the PCBs for you and also provide other services like 3D printing and metal sheet fabrication. So take a look at PCBWay.com, the link is also down below in the description, and let me thank PCBWay for sponsoring my videos, their help makes these videos possible. So thank you very much PCBWay, now let's continue with the Apple IIc. All right, well, the drive doesn't seem in a horrendous shape as usually happens with <laughs> with my computers, it's okay. Let me check whether the, the main puller here is working fine. It doesn't have any resistance or anything. So I'll remove the belt here and yes, it's the bearing is definitely, has definitely seen better moments. I mean, it's okay, but it should really, I think it should really spin a bit more. Now, there is a screw in here. So it'd be great maybe to try and remove this and see if I can lubricate the bearing a bit. What I'm doing here, I'm warming up the pulley, so that should free up the shaft in the middle. And I'm also adding some uh, cold spray on the shaft itself, so that should slightly um, shrink the pulley itself. We're talking about 
micrometers here, but that should be enough to loosen it so it can be removed without uh -huh. any additional tools. Yes. All right, let's see if cleaning the heads made any difference whatsoever. Yes, it's working, look at that. It was just dirty. <laughs> Amazing. Right, so this is working, it's great. Let's uh, run XPS and run some um, mechanism, dry mechanism exercise. So I'm hoping that running the drive upside down is okay. I, th I think it's a better option than having it here. Power on, three, two, one, go. No, it doesn't. <laughs> What's that? Right. Let's try this again now. Yes, better. Perfect. I would say let's check the speed first thing first, which is H. Well, the speed is spot on at 300 RPMs. I think the general recommendation is to keep it a bit slower rather than faster, but I'm not gonna complain about 300, but it looks okay. So let's run some uh, mechanism exercise here. Yeah. Right, the drive seems to be working totally fine, so that is great. I will uh, exercise a bit more after it's being cleaned and lubricated. What I like to do now is to adjust these two trimmers here, which are basically setting up the way the system sees the zeros and ones. And this doesn't need a reference diskette to do the alignment. We learned how to do that on my previous Apple II repair, which was fun because the drive failed at the end of the repair and eventually was that. Now I can see here from two different colors of goo that they applied to stop the trimmers from going around, that someone has done this adjustment after the factory. I'm assuming it's gonna be like a service center. But anyways, it's something it really takes five minutes to do and uh, I like to do as a preventing maintenance. So let's do that. Oh, and by the way, don't forget that I now have a second channel. It's called Tony259, I know. And uh, it has some videos which I feel don't belong on the main channel. So the link is down below in the description. Take a look and don't forget to subscribe if you like that content. Time to service the drive. Let me remove the PCB so we can access the mechanism and give it a good clean. Why do I feel that someone has been here already? <laughs>
Let's double check the drive still works before moving to something else. Otherwise, if something happens at the end, I don't know whether it was me doing something with the electronic boards or it was something mechanical while I was cleaning it. So let's give it a quick go. Three, two, one, go. Well, the drive still works, it's still a bit noisy, so let me see if I can find where the noise is coming from. Well, the noise clearly comes from the basket mechanism, but I disassembled it, I took notes on what went where. I do have a feeling that there might be some bits missing, like one of these um, spacers, they're not actually washers. Um, I do remember seeing more than only one on my own drive. So let me see, I think I've seen an exploded view somewhere and maybe I can see, maybe there's something missing, but yeah, it's definitely way too noisy now. I don't really like it. I need to find a way to quieten it up a bit. Now, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but it looks to me that the basket is like at an angle. I'm pretty confident I put everything back together the way I found it, uh, but it was noisy before. Why do I have a feeling that someone has been there before and uh, maybe forgotten to do something. I don't know, but I want to remove it again and see what's going on there because I, I don't like that. Right, I just removed the seeker washer and the little spacer and this is how I found it. I think that is the problem. The spring, which is uh, between the basket and the metal frame, has got stuck in the hole at an angle. I don't think that that should happen. So I'm pretty confident that it was supposed to be a metal washer or spacer on the other side as well. I'm 100% sure that I didn't find it. And I was a bit surprised to only find one spacer, uh, but there's definitely must be something on the other side, otherwise the spring will just get uh, lodged inside a hole at whatever angle, causing all sorts of issues. So um, I'm not sure that's the only thing missing here, but I do have this kind of spacer. I'm talking about this. Uh, they look like washers, but uh, I think they are called spacer. I do have all sorts of them. So I'll find one of these and I'll install it between the metal frame and the spring. Alternatively, I just installed the spring the other way around. <laughs> I think that's the way it's supposed to go. <laughs> yes, that was definitely my mistake. I'm glad that I was able to fix it and now everything is working fine. And you probably can't hear it through the microphone, but the drive is like a hundred times quieter than before. So I'm really, really happy with the outcome. The drive works perfectly and it sounds like new. Before I go ahead and align this drive, let me replace all the capacitors. Perfetto. All right, everything is more or less back together and I just made a copy of disk aid using my Apple IIe so I know it works. So we try and boot from this to confirm that the drive is still working. Then we're gonna check the amplitude. It's just a check, it basically tells whether the drive is still working or not. I'm expecting, totally expecting that to work. And finally, we are gonna adjust the comparator offset, which is that electronic adjustment that uh, uses these two trimmers here. 
So first thing first, let's uh, power on with these uh, floppy in and make sure that everything still works. And we got our disk aid, fantastic. Now I'm not sure I've ever used a disk aid on the same disk. I think I've always used it with the second drive. So let me see if I can set the target disk as um, itself. Ah, okay. And then I'm gonna run the amplitude test. Now the user interface here is very weird because to scroll down, to go down, I have to select S, skip, <laughs> and then A as accept. Read, write error. Um... Alrighty, Apple II E is out. And the reason I have it out is that this controller card here has two ports. So I can run the software from a good known drive and then run the test, uh, which I guess is destructive. That's probably maybe why it's not working on the drive and the test. Now, maybe that could be done on the Apple IIc as well, but definitely not with the uh, ROM 255 because I cannot run the floppy emu from the external port. Anyway, it's so much easier from here because I've got two ports and I know exactly how it works. Okie dokie, so let's set the target disk as the other drive. So it's gonna be slot six, but drive two, yes. And at this point, I have this drive here and I can run my amplitude test. Yes. <laughs> so obviously it needs a different drive. Okay. Perfect, this has worked. Now let me wire the oscilloscope and we should see 125 kilohertz signal of a specific amplitude coming back from the drive. The test is running, the frequency is more or less there, it says 127 kilohertz, I guess it's right, uh, but most importantly is the amplitude, that's the amplitude test, which has to be at least 150 millivolts, and we are reading almost 300 millivolts, so this is fine, and that's good because there's no adjustment for that. If this is not uh, meeting the uh, minimum of 150 millivolts, well the manual says to replace the drive, <laughs> or the, the board anyways. So yeah, that's good, and we know the drive is working. Now let's move to the comparator adjustment. The test is running. The first thing I need to check is that the uh, length of this uh, waveform is maximum four microsecond. And I would say it's more or less there. I can see it's a bit jittery on the right hand side. That's the second part of the test. But I would say it's just at its maximum. Now the pointy bit is supposed to be between 2.5 and 3 microsecond and it's 2.85 so that seems to be totally fine. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to move those streamers anyways because the last thing I want to do is to say yes this is working and then it gets moved around or with age or temperature it just miscalibrates itself. So let me remove the um, the seal or whatever it is on those streamers, I'll move them around, maybe put some contact cleaner and, and then I'll put it exactly where it was because the calibration is actually correct. The next part of the test is to minimize the jitter that you see on the right and left hand side of this waveform. Uh, so let's try that. It's difficult to see, but I can see that I could definitely improve on this one. So that's great. So obviously this is much worse. This is perfect. And this is much worse. I'm gonna leave it here. Perfect. And the previous waveform also is correct. So that completes my calibration. I think it was fine. Maybe that little uh, jitter adjustment, which I don't know exactly what it means from a, an electronic digital point of view, what could be improved. Uh, but anyways, it's nice to know that the drive is now 100%. Last thing to do to this drive is to check the speed. Since I have everything wired here with the Apple II, um, it's easy to run XPS. So let's restart with XPS and check the speed. We got 299 point something, I'm happy with that, and the drive is complete. And the drive is passing the XPS testing. So I'm happy with the drive, I'm really happy that we've gone through everything, recapped, rechecked, absolutely everything. More than that, we would need a reference diskette, which I don't have. But it seems like this drive is reading my Apple IIe floppy drive, so, you know, at some point you have to assume a little bit. I don't think those drives are uh, available anymore, even if they are, 
you don't really know in what kind of conditions they are. I think this is pretty good, I'm pretty happy with it. It's now time to take a look at the ROM and see if we can upgrade it. Now, I found this very nice article on uh, bigmesswires.com and it turns out there are four versions for the Apple IIc. Now, this is the very first one, version 255. With version 0, which is the second one, Apple removed the support for booting from disk 2 but added the uh, support for smart port devices. Version 3 is adding the ability to expand the RAM of this machine, but we don't have a RAM expansion uh, connector on this card, so it doesn't really make any sense. And version 4 is fixing some bugs introduced with version 3. So it feels like version 0 is the one that we want. Well, it turns out that version 255 is a 16 kilobytes ROM, while version 0, 3, and 4 are 32 kilobytes ROM. But Apple accounted for that. Probably it was uh, uh, was being planned. And there are a couple of bridges: this one, W1, and W2, which will need to be modified in order to upgrade from version 255 to anything newer than that. So I do have a 32 kilobyte blank ROM, so we can write this one, but I understand that we need to open this bridge here and uh, jumper this bridge here with a blob of solder. And that will allow the, the extra address line to work for the ROM, so the full 32 kilobyte of uh, ROM can be addressed. So first thing first, let me take care of those uh, bridges and then we'll burn the ROM and, and see if it works. The ROM is on the programmer and I've loaded the ROM 0 for the Apple IIc. Now, let me double check that this IC is actually blank because uh, I found it in a bag that says blank, but I'm not sure. There is a blank check. Yes, the device is blank, which is great. So we can program it and, and it should be usable. Perfect. Program complete. We can test it on this UC. Right, let's power up. Let's make sure it works and check the ROM version. Three, two, one, go. Yes, it's still working, which is good. <laughs> Version 0, that worked, that was super easy. I think it was the Apple IIe, which is using some um, different ICs and it's not as easy as writing a 27256, so like in this case, you have to use either an adapter or some very old uh, programmer. So fantastic, super easy, it's done. We've almost done with the 2C. The next thing I'd like to do is the full recap of both the motherboard and the DC-DC converter. So let's do that. There are only a handful of capacitors on the system and I'm replacing them as the preventing maintenance as this is what the owner of the machine has asked me to do. Replacing capacitors won't hurt, though things can go wrong sometimes, but this machine would have worked fine with its existing caps. I tested every capacitor I removed and they were all within specs. When replacing capacitors, I tend to use Panasonic ones FR series if available, which are some of the best on the market with very low ESR and rated 105 degrees Celsius. Those components will never go as high as 105 degrees, but as the life of a capacitor doubles every 10 degrees cooler they run, a higher temperature rating will extend the life by four times when compared to standard 85 degrees capacitors. Replacing the large 3300 microfarad capacitor in the DC to DC converter required a bit of work as axial capacitors are not available anymore, so I had to solder a copper wire to extend one of the legs and then insulate everything. It's usually easy to do on small ones, this large one required a bit more time and attention. Surprisingly, I found some proper corrosion on the PCB, which is bizarre as I didn't see any leakage nearby. It took me some time to dissolve it with solder and flux, but thankfully it came back as new. 
The motherboard has literally four capacitors on it, so that was a simple thing to do. Great care needs to be paid to the smoothing capacitor connected to the minus 5 volts rail, as it's intentionally wired backwards. That is, the positive lead is connected to ground. It's easy to make a mistake when negative voltages are involved. Ask me how I know that. It's PCB bath time. I used my favorite cleaning fluid, Electrolube SWAS. I want to show you why I really like it. Let me apply a piece of tape on this pad and you'll understand why in a moment. <laughs> the outcome is amazing as usual. Does it really need it? Maybe not, but I love knowing that there is a shiny PCB inside this old machine. The fluid I'm using is very good at removing oxidation, let me show you. These should show that very nicely. The tape has stopped the fluid from reaching these areas, so you can see the before and after. I didn't sand or polish that area at all, it was actually a very quick bath, as I didn't want to remove too many original markings and labels. Yet, that was enough for the fluid to work its magic and remove oxidation from this layer of solder. The case also gets a nice wash and came out pretty nice. The keyboard also gets the TLC it deserves. I didn't remove the keycaps or apply contact cleaner as this keyboard just works beautifully. After a quick check to make sure that all is well, including running Adrian's memory test program, it's time to screw everything back together and reassemble the case. I'm really happy with the outcome of this Apple IIc, it didn't require too much, little tweaking, cleaning, recapping, washing, and it's come back almost brand new besides the uh, yellowed plastics. Now I'm an Apple IIe person, as my family purchased an Apple IIe when I was like 8 years old, so I'm a bit attached to the Apple II family. I think this is almost my favourite though, because it's very compact. And it comes with everything you would normally find in an Apple IIe, the RAM expansion, the serial output, and uh, the drive is internal, so you don't have a chunky drive outside of the unit. I really like the Apple IIc, I'm happy to have one, and I'm really happy that this is now as happy as I could make it. Too bad that my own Apple IIc doesn't have the Alps keyboard, this is really amazing, and hopefully one day I'll come across one. I guess this is it for today's video, I hope you enjoyed it, if you did, as usual, I'd appreciate a thumb up down below, and also consider subscribing to this channel if you like this kind of things. Don't forget that I also have a second channel, so take a look, you might like what's in there, and uh, don't forget to join me on Twitter and on Patreon as well. 
Let me take this opportunity to thank all my Patreon supporters. Their names are scrolling at the side of the screen. Thank you very much. You are absolutely amazing. There is a free tier on Patreon, so feel free to join me there if you want. If you don't want to join me on Patreon, you can buy me a coffee. The link is also down below in the description. If you don't want to buy me a coffee, that's totally fine. Just watching this video and maybe like it and leave a comment. That's enough for me. Well, that's it for me. I wish you a great day. Thank you for watching and hope to see you again here soon on my channels for my next videos. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye-bye.